Thank you so much, uh, Vicente, for, for your kind introductions. And uh, thank you, of course, uh, Professor Krugman uh, for coming here um, after, uh, I think, uh, your last visit was about 10 years ago or so at this uh, same uh, institution. Uh, what I'm going to do is ask a, a few questions about the book, which I've read in its English version. Uh, but I take it that the Spanish translation is absolutely superb. And I'd like to also congratulate Critica uh, for uh, their work there. And uh, I'm going to ask a few questions over the next uh, 30 minutes or 35 minutes or so. And then we're going to take uh, uh, questions from, from the audience. Uh, so uh, please uh, you know, be ready uh, for that. Uh, so uh, first of all, this book is about zombies and uh, the way in which they think or they fail to think properly about uh, major economic issues. And uh, in particular, as you say repeatedly throughout the book, that, that they ignore uh, good theory and uh, the evidence uh, that exists out there. So we have an election coming up in the United States. Let me start there, yeah. okay, far away from Spain. Yeah. So which are the zombies in that election that we should fear the most? Okay, so in the United States, this is not always true everywhere, but in the United States, all of the important zombies are on the right. Um, and uh, uh, it's because uh, what keeps the zombies, you know, what keeps them undead, what keeps them shambling along and eating people's brains is, is mostly money. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's right-wing billionaires that are usually the prime movers. Um, and um, so we have a, a president who passed a massive tax cut on the, on the claim that tax cuts, cutting taxes on rich people pays for itself, which is a zombie idea. It's proved false many times. They keep on saying it. They said they did it again, and of course the, the deficit exploded. Um, we have a, a basically climate change denial uh, president, uh, and the majority of members of Republican members of Congress deny that climate change is happening. Um, and uh, uh, th those would be the two that would be the biggest. I mean, there are lots of other things in here, but uh, I mean, we also, uh, it, I don't really talk about too much uh, on the U European circuit, but um, uh, the, the, the ruling party in the United States believes that it's impossible to guarantee health care to everybody. Every other advanced country manages to do it, but they insist that we can't and, and insist that, that the reforms that we had, despite uh, in fact having um, made a huge positive difference, are a failure. So uh, those were the ones that, that are on the, on the table. There's nothing remotely comparable on the other side. So how would you respond to somebody who says, okay, so you may be right, However, the economy is doing great. Uh, so why is that? Is that uh, because uh, Obama actually laid the foundations? Sure. Or is it because these guys uh, you know, have uh, come up with a new way of uh, you know, magic uh, that uh, you know, makes things happen in a way that we didn't, uh, never anticipated? Well, there are two pieces to the answer. The first is, do a chart. Actually, I tweeted one out this morning um, uh, showing uh, uh, GDP growth uh, and employment growth in the United States since the end of the Great Recession. And if you, all you knew was that chart and you didn't know that there was an election in 2016, you would have no idea that anything happened. They're both just straight lines. It's a, it's a, what we've seen is, is just a complete continuation of the trend. Uh, now, it is true that the US economy, the recovery from the financial crisis was slower than it should have been. Uh, but that was overwhelmingly because of fiscal austerity because uh, Republicans in Congress insisted on forcing spending cuts, refused any, you know, Obama desperately wanted to spend on infrastructure, uh, they, because Republicans said that public debt is a terrible threat and deficits are evil, and then the Republican entered the White House, and all of a sudden they forgot about all of that. Uh, I, I, so I've been saying it's very important to notice what Trump said about the the budget deficit in his last two State of the Union addresses, which is nothing, not one word. After, after spending the entire Obama administration, debt is an existential threat to America. Republicans suddenly lost interest in the subject. And Trump inherited a deficit of $600 billion and has blown it up to a trillion dollars. And even though it's not a very good deficit, it's uh, mostly giving money to corporations which are using it to buy back stock, uh, it's still a, that's a big fiscal stimulus. And so uh, basically Trump has done a, 
a, a Keynesian stimulus to the U.S. economy. I mean, the Trump, the Trump um, uh, budget deficit expansion, the stuff you can attribute directly to his policies, is almost as big as Obama's stimulus at its peak, except that was, that was when unemployment was 9%, and Trump did it when unemployment was 4%. So, yeah, if you're going to... One way to say it is that Republicans basically sabotaged the economy as long as there was a Democrat in the White House right. and stopped sabotaging it once <laughs> Trump was there. And uh, they may be politically rewarded for it, but that's, a, that, that's not, a, not, a, not a happy story. Yeah, so let me ask you this question, and I ask you for forgiveness in advance, okay? Sure. So the question is, if Trump tomorrow were able to get, let's say, a $50 billion uh, or $60 billion program through Congress, yeah to build a wall between the U.S. and Mexico. Would you favor that as a, a good uh, you know, economic stimulus? I mean, it's a, it, would do, it would be a stimulus. Uh, the, I mean, what, back during the crisis, I actually suggested that, uh, you know, it was a joke, but I suggested that we should uh, uh, invent a threat from space aliens uh, so that we need to spend money to defend against, because we needed to spend money. And, uh, and even if it was for a silly purpose, it would be helpful. Um, so now that there are other sides to it, I mean the, uh, you know, Mexico is is our neighbor, and uh, it, uh, building walls against our, our neighbors is is going to hurt us a lot in the long term. It's going to hurt Mexico too, but it, that's a bad thing. But uh, but you know, if Trump wanted, if he wanted an actual infrastructure bill, if he wanted to actually repair our roads uh, and fix our railroads he would have the support of almost every Democrat in Congress. So the, the only thing that's stopping us from having a real economic stimulus is the fact that, that uh, Trump and his, and his party don't want to do good things. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Now, in, on, on page 10 of your book, um, in the English edition, you write, and I'm going to quote, um, I see Trump not as a departure from the past so much as the culmination of where movement conservatism has been taking us for decades, unquote. Yeah. Uh, so can you elaborate on this? Is Trump then just an epiphenomenon? Is he just uh, uh, insignificant because this has been going on for a long time and uh, what we see today is perhaps a zenith in this trend? Or? Well, uh, something like Trump was going to happen. I mean, we were... Um, the U.S. movement conservatism, for people who don't know, they, they, they're... There, this is a, re, they, the U.S. parties are different. The Democratic Party is a loose coalition of interest groups. The Republican Party is an arm of a larger, very cohesive movement, what we call movement conservatism. It includes the Republican Party, Fox News, think tanks, a whole uh, array of organizations which are all uh, tend to uh, operate in, in concert. Uh, they are all pretty much funded by the same people. Um, and has been increasingly uh, moving towards uh, uh, authoritarian tendencies. Uh, I, I say actually, uh, uh, this is pretty, may sound extreme, but it's actually simply the truth. The, re the Republican Party is an authoritarian regime in waiting and has been for some time. We've been moving in this direction for quite a while. Uh, the uh, exploitation of racial hostility to win elections goes all the way back to Ronald Reagan. Uh, so this actually goes back to Richard Nixon, but, but really took off under Reagan. So all of these things were present. Now, Trump has, the surprise about Trump is, is that he's, he's much, uh, he's, that he's so naked about it, that, uh, that he's vulgar and crass. And uh, the, the, uh, I think we were kind of expected, there was going to be a Trump-like figure but I expected it was going to be somebody who was uh, smoother and more. Yeah. Uh, in fact, uh, in a way, we were lucky, right? If if we had if we had someone who was less repulsive than Trump, uh, and who was smarter than Trump, probably American <laughs> democracy would be lost. You know, if, if Trump were the were as smart as Viktor Orban in Hungary, uh, my country would be lost already. Some people argue that the good thing about Trump is that he doesn't like wars, foreign wars. Oh. Uh, do you agree with that? We don't know that. I mean, he certainly doesn't have a problem with killing people, um, but uh, uh, but I think every uh, he and but it's true that he shied away from a war you know, with with Iran. Uh, but then I think anyone would have. I think uh, um, what he doesn't like he he's actually when when faced with someone who can actually strike back, Trump tends to back down. I mean. Uh, 
in effect, uh, he's back down on the trade war with China. You know, after all of that stuff about how we needed fundamental change, the Chinese have bought him off by agreeing to buy more soybeans. Um, and uh, he's back down uh, in confrontations over, uh, uh, you know, the, he backed down on NAFTA. It was the worst agreement in, in history. And, and then he got a new agreement, which is almost indistinguishable from the old agreement. Um, so, uh, so that means, uh, so uh, now sometimes that's the right thing. You know, not, not going to war with North Korea, not going to war, oh, North Korea, of course, he really backed down there. He, he, he basically surrendered to, to, uh, to Kim. Um, but, uh, you know, not, not going to war with Iran is, is, uh, is a rational thing. And uh, so, I'm, but I don't, I don't imagine that any U.S. president is going to, after, after the way Iraq turned out, I think everybody has, has discovered that, you know, dreams of conquest are, are not, are <laughs> tend to turn into nightmares very quickly. Yeah. So let's turn to economics now. We're in Spain, we're in Southern Europe. And uh, over the years, and this is reflected in the book, uh, you've written uh, quite a bit about uh, austerity policies yeah. and the fact that, um, in your view, most of the time they don't work. Could you give me like three concise reasons, uh, the top three reasons? I know there are many more. Right. Why do you think in the context of Southern Europe over the last uh, 10 years or so, austerity policies have been, uh, you know, have done so much more harm, in your view, than they have uh, benefited these countries? What are the top three things right. that you think are... Well, the question is, what is the payoff supposed to be right. to austerity policies? Uh, uh, the, so one argument is that austerity policies um, uh, help you avoid a, a debt crisis. But it turns out that debt crises are a very distant problem. Uh, there, there was a panic in the bond markets in, in 2011, 2012. Uh, and Spain was, uh, was part of that panic. But that panic went away not because Spain balanced its budget, but because Mario Draghi said three words, whatever it takes. And all of a sudden, you know, all of the interest. So, um, aside from Greece, nobody is, is now, bond markets don't seem to be concerned. So austerity doesn't actually help because the bond markets are happy to lend money cheaply to just about anybody who isn't, who isn't really deep in the hole. Greece is completely unique. Um, the second, uh, the claim that, uh, that uh, austerity will uh, improve private sector confidence uh, and, and will actually be expansionary, even though you're, you're eliminating jobs directly, that more jobs will be created, just doesn't, I mean, I, I made fun of one of my favorite phrases, and I, I'm always happy when I introduce a phrase into economics and other people pick it up, and I, I call that uh, uh, believing in the confidence fairy. And uh, the confidence fairy has not made an appearance anywhere. Uh, that, that just doesn't happen. <laughs> um, and the third is the, uh, I guess, if there's a third reason, um, you know, people, the austerity was supposed to prevent a runaway debt spiral. Um, but we actually, interest rates, with interest rates well below growth rates, basically everywhere, debt spirals don't happen. Uh, what matters is the ratio of debt to GDP. I'm sorry, I'm starting to get to sound like an economics professor here. But what matters is not the absolute euro value of debt, but the ratio of debt to GDP. With interest rates below the growth rate of GDP, um, debt actually melts away. Uh, it, it's uh, having a higher level of debt instead of causing a spiral where interest rates make the debt uh, go up even faster. What happens is that having more debt means that it melts faster because of inflation and growth, and so. Uh, the debt spiral is just a, is just a, uh, a myth. It's not something that, that you need to worry about. So um, all of the premises on which the big move to austerity were based have turned out to be false. Uh, I mean, it's a quite remarkable thing now that you have uh, you know, Olivier Blanchard, who uh, a friend, but uh, was the chief economist of the IMF, and his big presidential address to the American Economic Association uh, last year was, uh, uh, you know, all, this, all these worries about debt are hugely exaggerated. We shouldn't be, uh, we've been focusing on the wrong thing. That's the most mainstream economics that you can have. Uh, when, uh, so it, this is, uh, uh, that whole, that, that mindset where um, uh, public debt became the, the, the most important issue in the minds of, of policymakers was a, a, just a complete fo uh, uh, false trail. It led, it led off into, into nowhere, and meanwhile, a lot of harm was done. 
Yeah. So I'm pretty sure that uh, you know probably 20 or 30 percent of the people sitting here in this room are fiscal conservatives. Right. Okay. So uh, you, we may call them zombies, right? Because they don't, uh, they don't get this. I don't but, call uh, any people zombies. Right. You, you some, call the ideas. There are. Right? I mean, yeah. there, there certainly are but, some, but I don't. Uh, right. But I use the ter I use the terms zombies. So for if we ideas. wanted to bring them to our side, right, uh, and uh, make them see once and for all. Uh, you're mistaken. Uh, what do you think might be, at this point, right, we're in 2020, uh, so uh, not, not uh, 10 years ago, not five years ago. Uh, what can we tell them? Well, Those who remain unpersuaded. Let's, um, let's, let me give you a couple of, of, of contemporaneous examples. Okay. Right, so um, um, one example is actually of what, where we started. I mean, the, uh, uh, to the extent that, that the U.S. economy is outperforming the European economy. It's because the United States is engaged in deficit spending. I don't like the form of the deficit spending, but uh, but it's it's all you know. The the, uh, the U.S. has abandoned fiscal restraint. Uh, the e, uh, the euro area has remained fiscally responsible. Guess who's winning uh, from that? Um, Japan has uh, you know Japan is far deeper in debt than than any Western country. Uh, more than 200% of GDP, and you would think, well, there you should be doing austerity. But first of all, Japan can borrow at negative interest rates, so the, the, the financial markets aren't punishing them. And second, Japan, every once in a while, tries to do the fiscally uh, conservative thing, so they just did. They just hiked the value-added tax, and the result is that the economy is shrinking at a 6% annual rate. So, uh, no, it just, look at all of the examples to, of, on the one hand, the U.S., which is being profligate, and only good things are happening as a result. On the other hand, Japan, which is acting responsibly, and only bad things are happening as a result. Right. Um, still on economics. On page 131, uh, you wrote um, the following, I'm paraphrasing here, uh, that the Chicago School of Economics uh, is pretty much the same as, uh, quote, the dark age of macroeconomics, unquote. Yes. Uh, and I, I use could that... Could you uh, expand on that so a little I bit? I use the, the phrase dark age uh, very deliberately, very carefully. Um, dark age is not the same as barbarism. Okay. Barbarism you never knew about civilization. Dark age, you used to be civilized, but you forgot it. Um, and what happened is that we used to know a lot about what you do in a depressed economy. We used to know that you used fiscal stimulus to, uh, to fight unemployment, that you didn't, that you didn't worry about inflation um, when the economy was depressed. Uh, but a large part of the economics profession um, sort of said, well, you know, if, if people are perfectly rational and markets are efficient, that those things can't happen. Right. Therefore, they don't happen. And so they managed to forget. I mean, it was literally the case uh, um, that, that in uh, many of the graduate uh, departments in the United States, uh, the old stuff, the, the, the actually useful pieces of macroeconomics, were not taught. Uh, we were going through these debates in, in early 2009 about fiscal stimulus, and it became clear that there were you know, tenured professors of economics at major universities in the United States who had never, who were, invent who were reinventing 80-year-old fallacies, thinking, thinking that they were deep insights. Uh, they had completely forgotten. So it's like the, we, we had lost the knowledge. We, it, we, we were like uh, you know, the, the, um, the hard-won knowledge from the Great Depression was being kept alive instead of monasteries. It was being kept alive in central banks. But uh, out there, and, uh, meanwhile, we had uh, um, you know, uh, economic bandits ravaging the countryside. <laughs> Uh, now, your academic advisor at MIT was uh, Rudy Dornbusch. Indeed. Didn't he get his PhD from the University of Chicago? Yes. Um, uh, let me say so Chicago... So you're, you're the grandson of a Chicago... I mean, the... Yeah. It, sort of. Uh, but it's a little bit complicated. Okay. <laughs> right now, actually, uh, so we have this distinction. We talk about saltwater versus freshwater right. schools, right? The, it turns out the places that are Keynesian are MIT, Berkeley, uh, Harvard, and the places yeah, that, yeah. Harvard, the places yeah. that are anti-Keynesian are traditionally Chicago, um, Minnesota, Rochester, right. um, so inland. Uh, the, now, it turns out that Chicago, 
um, is kind of brackish. <clears throat> it's a little bit salty. Uh, <clears throat> Chicago you was... You mean Lake Michigan, you mean? Uh, well, not the, not the lake, but not the, 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 the economic department. Okay. Uh, and Chicago wasn't always as extreme as it became, uh, and it is not now as extreme as it was. So Rudy Dornbusch was a student of Robert Mundell, yeah. and Robert Mundell's uh, uh, work was pretty Keynesian. Uh, later on, he, he, he changed some of his views, but at the time that Rudy studied with him, uh, the, the Mundell model was, was actually pretty much what I used to think about open economy macroeconomics. Um, so it's a, it, and yeah, I mean, Rudy, and Rudy was a, a we, we could go, I could, I could happily deliver an hour long eulogy for Rudy Darmbush, who was a great economist and a great teacher, um, and uh, very, uh, the, the least Chicago like Chicago graduate I've known, and also the least German like German economist I've ever known. So. Now, Robert Mundell, um, so he was the one who uh, essentially proposed that the uh, Eurozone was an optimal currency area. Well, actually not. If you actually read his paper... He did paper, not do that? Okay, could no. you explain that to yeah, us? So Mundell is, it was responsible for the, the theory of optimum currency okay. areas okay. and laid down a set of preconditions to which other people added. What do you need for it to be a good idea to share a currency? And Mundell emphasized high, high mo mobility of labor, uh, but then other people talked about um, uh, my late colleague Peter Cannon, the importance of fiscal integration, and it became clear that uh, a monetary, a banking union was really essential. And it was actually those of us who took the optimum currency area theory seriously and looked at proposals for the euro 20 years ago and said, you know, Europe really doesn't look like an optimum currency area. This, is, this looks like a mistake. And... Uh, and um, the, and the predictions about the, the predictions about the way things could go wrong have pretty much come true. I mean, the most important, actually, let me talk for a second about Spain. I mean, of course. The, what, uh, by the way, this is one of these things where it crosses over. Who, who actually made the, originally made the case for flexible exchange rates was Milton Friedman. And what Milton Friedman said was, look, if you are, if you have, are stuck with a fixed exchange rate or a single currency and some shock hits your economy, then maybe you can eventually recover. But to get to that recovery, you have to go through years of high unemployment, uh, gradual, you know, grinding uh, deflation relative to your trading partners. So yes, in the long run, you can get back there, but the cost along the way will be huge. And that's the story of Spain over the past 10 years. Uh, unemployment goes to 20%. Eventually, Spanish costs fall relative to the rest of Europe and becomes a, a place to export from again. But but uh, to call that a success story, I mean, I, I've, uh, uh, it, it's, it's like a, a pyrrhic victory, right? The, uh, uh, another couple of success stories like this and you'll be destroyed. <laughs> so this morning you argued in an op-ed published in the, yeah. in the New York Times that uh, it wouldn't make sense now to unravel the euro, uh, but rather uh, to actually build all of those institutions that are needed. So could you, could, you walk times, us, but that... yeah, could you walk us uh, through the logic okay. of that? It's, it's very much, so not entering a currency union uh, is one thing, and that's straightforward, you just don't join. Uh, once you're in, so suppose that, um, I mean, uh, Spain doesn't seem to be a, in a position, you know, talking about it. Suppo suppose that, uh, uh, I don't know, who, whoever, who is, who is running Italy now, if anyone is running Italy, but anyway, suppose that the Italian government decided to leave the Euro. Right. Um, the first thing that you would have is everybody has bank accounts in euros. They would be immediately be massive capital flight as people tried to pull out. Um, and um, so maybe you could implement capital controls, but it's very hard because it is so integrated with the rest of Europe. Um, all of the contracts are in euros. Do you abrogate all the contracts? Do you rewrite them? Which contracts, if, if you introduce a new lira, uh, which contracts are, are, are actually in lira and, uh, and which are, are still in euros? Uh, do we expropriate, uh, uh, if, it's, if it's a contract with a German, does it stay in euros or are we going to expropriate German investors? It's a huge mess. I mean, if, if the situation is extreme enough, it may be warranted, but it's, um, the trouble with having adopted the euro as a currency and having worked lived within the euro now for, um, for 20 years, is that uh, extricating yourself is an extremely disruptive, costly process. I mean, we haven't seen, the last time 
anyone broke up a currency, broke up an existing currency area and sep turned it into separate currencies, as far as I know, is, is uh, after the fall of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, after World War I. And, uh, and they did it, but the way they did it was that all of the constituent countries, Austria, Hungary, and then the various small, they closed their borders for two weeks and, uh, and forced everybody to exchange their currency. Can we do that in the modern world? I mean, it's a very, uh, I mean, it's possible, but my God, we're, we're, uh, it, it's a hugely expensive, difficult thing to do. So conditional on the fact that we have the euro yeah. in a number of countries in Europe now, you've been arguing that then we should have fiscal union oh. to support it. You should. I mean, it's, it's not. I think that's probably all, be also beyond the realm of possibility. Uh, the, the thing that you definitely, the thing for which there is no excuse is not having banking union. There is absolutely no reason why banks uh, across Europe should not have a common safety net. Uh, that, um, something like the U.S. Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Uh, it's, it's insane not to, because the, there's so much interdependence so that, that it's crazy that the, that the burden of bailing out failing banks should fall on the country where they happen to be um, uh, domiciled. Um, a fiscal union would be good. I mean, I, I do a comparison of Spain with Florida, mm -hmm. uh, which turned out to be roughly, it's a surprisingly comparable cases. Uh, both of, you know, you both have good weather, uh, both have lots of beach houses owned by uh, foreigners, uh, both had giant housing bubbles that popped. Um, but when Florida's housing bubble imploded, uh, first of all, the banks were bailed out by Washington. The pensions continued to be paid by Washington. The health care continued to be paid for by Washington. Just automatically as a, uh, unemployment benefits were paid largely by Washington. All, as a, just because we have a, f a fiscal union, there was an automatic safety net for, for Florida when, that, that Spain didn't have at all. And, um, but the trouble with Europe is um, uh, uh, Europe is, uh, the, the, level, the inequality of income is high, so the, uh, it's very hard to persuade the rich parts to subsidize the poor parts. Uh, and you don't have a sense of, uh, of cohesiveness. I mean, when, when I talk about the troubles with Europe, the partly problem, the problems with the euro, I'd like to point out, to, you know, look at the currency, uh, the, the notes, which have pictures of bridges and, and doors. And you ask, uh, which bridge, which door? And the answer is no particular. They're generic because if you... Uh, they actually had to break up some plates, right? There were some, some notes that were, the, the, the bridge was identifiably, it was the Pont Neuf in Paris. And that's unacceptable. You can't honor any one country. So, you know, U.S. currency has pictures of dead presidents on it. Uh, European currency has pictures of generic things because Europe is not a country. And that's, it's very hard to have a fiscal union if you don't have a sense of nationhood. Yeah. On Keynesianism, as, you know, policy making these days, is it possible in one country with uh, liberalized uh, capital flows? Oh, yeah. In fact, that's Mundell yeah. was the one. Uh, the, uh, Mundell uh, created modern international macroeconomics uh, because he was Canadian. And he was thinking about the problems uh, uh, about making policy in Canada, which at the time was the only uh, major country with a floating exchange rate and, of course, t totally open capital movement. But Canada has independent policy. Um, as long as you um, uh, are willing to let your currency float, and even to some extent if you aren't, but there's a, there's a lot of autonomy of policy. Uh, the, uh, uh, it, 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 they're really, people exaggerate the extent to which um, international, I mean, in some ways international movements of capital even reinforce your, uh, your policy autonomy. Uh, you don't, uh, um, if, you, if you have your own money, and you, you cut interest rates, you get an extra benefit uh, from the depreciation of your currency, which makes your exports more competitive. So no, the notion that somehow the world is too integrated for countries to have their own policy. Integrated, yeah. Financially integrated, definitely not. And, and you know, if, 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 um, if goods markets were perfectly integrated, then there might be a problem because stimulus would go to someplace else. But, but in fact, uh, Three quarters of, of value added is non-tradable everywhere, so it's not actually an issue. Okay, so one last question on Keynesianism. So back in the 50s and the 60s, uh, or at least part of the 60s, there was a broad political consensus in the United States and in Europe, not just uh, uh, cross parties, but also including unions and including yeah. uh, employer associations, that that was the way to go. 
But today, ostensibly, this is absent, right? There's no consensus, right? So we have uh, uh, you know, people on one side, people on the other. So then, is it is really possible, from a political point of view, to implement in a sustained way Keynesian policies? Well, um, success tends to, uh, tends to um, generate its own support. So, um, uh, I mean, I mean uh, the, uh, my, uh, uh, in some ways the worst moment I had was, was in early 2009 when uh, Obama was proposing his stimulus. Um, and it was obviously too small. I was tearing my hair out saying it's too small. And the problem with it being too small is because it's too small, people will say, oh, it failed. Although, in fact, it, there's now universal agreement among economists that it helped. But if it had been bigger, then it would have been a clear success story and it would have been validating. So the, if you're going to be Keynesian, basically do it, uh, uh, do it on a sufficient scale so that people can see the benefits. Okay. Um, you're clearly the best uh, trade economist since David Ricardo. There's no question about that, right? Uh, I mean, that was a long time ago. I so would, now, uh, come on. John Stuart Mill might disagree. Uh, okay, anyway. all right. So, uh, important question here. So, uh, do you think there are any serious economists this day, today, who um, support or who um, say that uh, mercantilism works? Oh, no. We, there, are no, there are no serious mercantilists. Nobody who has thought about it at all thinks that the measure of success is whether you run, run a trade surplus. That's, that's not how the world works. Um, there, I, I think we've gotten a, uh, a better picture of the dark side of globalization. Uh, we, we always knew. I mean, I, I, I never denied that there were going to be some losers from globalization and that there were going to be some negative impacts of, uh, on, on real wages uh, of some workers from, from rising trade. Uh, I thought they weren't huge, and I still think uh, in the aggregate they weren't huge. But with what, I, what I failed to realize, and I kicked myself a bit because I, I should have known, um, and I, uh, as it turns out, the, the people who, who actually figured it out are my students, um, that, um, that the impacts of globalization, although they're relatively small, spread across the economy, in fact, they tend to be very concentrated. So when, when imports from China rose, that displaced, all right, probably displaced about a million workers in the United States. Believe it or not, that's a tiny, in the United States, a half, one and a half million workers are fired every month, right? It's a, for, for various causes. So it's not that big a deal in the, in the context of the US economy. But if you were somebody producing furniture, and the US furniture industry is concentrated in a small part of the state of North Carolina, that particular region was hit really, really hard by Chinese imports. So the downside to communities that were in the path of, of globalization was bigger than we realized. I failed, I failed to, to see that, which I, I should have known because I, localization of industry is one of my things. And so I think we, we, we did miss. There, there, was more, there, there were more dark shadows from the globalization than, than people like me acknowledge. That doesn't mean it was a mistake. It doesn't mean that the world is a much better place because, especially because poor countries have the ability to export, but, uh, but we should have had much better safety net to deal with the downsides. Okay, I have uh, three or four more questions. Uh, so uh, I'm just telling the audience so that you get ready. Uh, okay. So asking your own questions. Uh, so the first is, um, there's only four references to China in the um, subject yeah. index of your book. Four references in a book that has, uh, in its English edition, uh, 400 pages. Yeah. Is that because China is insignificant? No, it's because I didn't, uh, it's partly I had to make some choice. And since this is, uh, since this is a book mostly about bad ideas in, uh, in, in Western political debate, uh, China you know, I, I doesn't figure that much. It's also true that although I think about China, um, I don't at all consider myself an expert. I mean, uh, uh, China, China is actually particularly hard because you don't, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a numbers guy. I like to you know, work with economic statistics. Uh, but in Ch you know, Chinese economic statistics are a, a, a kind of a boring form of science fiction. You, don't, you, never, <laughs> you never know what, what to believe. Um, and, um, and so you go to someone who's a genuine expert in China, you ask what's really happening. 
and he or she tells you something, and then you go to another China expert, and he or she tells you something different. And so, uh, so I don't feel like I have the competence to say a whole lot about China. Um, and uh, there, were, there were some periods when I've had a, more to say, but they just didn't, we had to make some selectivity. Yeah. Uh, and just look, in general, uh, China is, is a huge story for the world, but in terms of, of US and European economic policy, uh, China is, a, is, is not the core of, of, of our problems. So, um, back in the 1990s, you wrote a piece that I really like, uh, Foreign Affairs. Uh, if you remember the, um, the myth of the age, East Asian miracle? Yeah. It was mostly about South Korea and Taiwan. That's right. Uh, do you think there's a myth about uh, the Chinese uh, economic miracle as well? So all of this has to do, of course, with productivity, right? Yeah. Uh, well, the, the argument about those countries was that the highly, extremely rapid growth was, had a lot to do with, with just plain accumulation of capital and that they were going to run into growth limits, uh, which has sort of happened. Uh, although, you know, people think that that article forecast the Asian financial crisis, which it didn't. So I, I got some undeserved credit uh, for, um, uh, I'd like to, I used to say that, that um, it predated that the crisis. Though. It predated the crisis. Yeah. But I, I like to say that I was actually 90% wrong about the Asian crisis. The only problem was that, the only thing is that everybody else was 110% wrong. So I, 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 I was, I look good by comparison. And China, now I would say China shows some of the same syndromes. I mean, China's growth is based upon unsustainably high levels of capital accumulation. Um, and I keep on thinking that there's going to be a, a reckoning, a crash, but I've been saying that for a long time and the Chinese keep on finding ways to keep it going. So I, I've kind of backed off on being at all confident about where China is going. Uh, it, it's, at some point, uh, you know, China is, um, the, they, they've been able to grow by investing 50% of GDP and also by pulling hundreds of millions of underemployed peasants into the modern sector. And both of those reach limits, and Chinese growth is slowing, but they, uh, they have been able to, uh, to I mean, they, they don't have any problems being Keynesian, put it that way. Whenever they have a slowdown, they, they go right ahead and start uh, building infrastructure and propping up the economy. So uh, they've been more durable than I expected. So there are fewer people who entertain zombie ideas in China than in Europe or the United States, in a way. It probably. I mean, the Chinese have their, the Chinese are, are, are amazingly non-ideological. They're pretty pragmatic about their policy. They have other problems. I mean, they, uh, um, they, they, you know, any government has the problem of um, how do you know when you have a problem if people uh, are afraid to tell you the truth and tell you what you want to hear. And we've, we're actually kind of seeing that with the coronavirus. It was clear that, that, the, that the authoritarian nature of the Chinese uh, system um, delayed a response, uh, possibly crucially. Uh, so, uh, so there are downsides to their system, but, uh, but yeah, the, uh, um, uh, they don't have the same uh, uh, ideological rigidity that has blocked policy in, in both in Europe and the United States. This is not praise for the regime. You know, I, this is, it's horrifying, the, the backsliding on, on democracy. Uh, back, the, China was never close to being democratic, but it's become uh, worse, it's become more authoritarian under sea than it was be, before. So uh, this is not a defense of the regime, but their economic policy has, in many cases, been smarter than, than that, that in the West. Yeah. If we should switch gears for the last uh, two questions. Climate change. Yeah. So what is the best, uh, from your perspective, way to uh, bring under control the problem? Carbon taxes on companies, behavioral change by consumers, tax incentives for green energy, uh, getting the prices right on the externalities. What is, what is, the, uh, so, what is the formula? So the answer to that is yes. To all, all of them. Okay. Uh, uh, no, and, and, and this is where I, I actually have so, some of my colleagues uh, are purists. To say the problem is the price is wrong, have a carbon tax, and that should be the centerpiece of your policy. That's where I was going. Okay. And I, I don't, I, first of all, it's not clear to me that's even right on the economics, because uh, um, endogenous technology, God, I, I'm, I'm, I must be tired. I'm, I, there, there must be a way to say that in English. But anyway, but you know, the <laughs> technological developments, the, the, this incredible revolution that we've had in solar and wind power didn't happen purely because of the private sector had a lot to do with government investment in technology. So government investment in technology, government spending on, on green infrastructure is, 
is good economics. The carbon tax doesn't do that by itself. Um, and then also politically, uh, the, if, you're going to, um, it, if you're going to actually get the policy, it can't be just about sacrifice. It can't be saying to people, well, you must drive smaller cars or stop driving. Or, uh, it has to be something that, that can, has positive sides, too. So you want to, you know, the Green New Deal uh, we talk about in the United States. Nobody knows you know, quite what it means, which is good. The fact that the Green New Deal can be lots of stuff, some of which is about saving the planet, some of which is about job creation, some of which is about just fixing potholes, um, is, is a, you need to package your climate policies with a lot of other stuff. And that's, uh, so, I, so I'm very, I'm for an eclectic approach, very broad based, and don't worry about, don't worry about it being the textbook solution because uh, things are too urgent to, to be concerned about purity. We just need to, to do whatever it takes to get the uh, political consensus behind action. So my last question, um, I, I, I strongly believe that inequality is one of the most yeah. serious problems that we're facing. Now, you just mentioned technological change. Technological yeah. change in many industries uh, around the world is going to put a lot of people out of work. Potentially, perhaps, if that happens, so yeah. let's, let's uh, assume that that's right. going to be true, that uh, there's going to be fewer jobs for a lot of people, uh, what kinds of initiatives out there would you favor? I mean, there's, for example, the universal basic income. There's uh, you know, a number of uh, initiatives out there. But first, how do you conceptualize the problem, assuming that it's real, right? Which, well, but that's the problem. I mean, yeah. the thing so is... So you don't, you don't believe that if, it is a... Uh, I mean, t technological change is displacing jobs. Uh, but it always has. There has yeah. been no point in the past two centuries when there wasn't some revolutionary technology displacing jobs in some part of the economy. Um, and if anything, the pace of that change in the past decade has been slower than it was uh, in previous decades. Productivity growth has been unusually low, not unusually high, in the last 10 years. Um, the number of jobs displaced by technology is probably smaller. Um, I think there's a real bias. There's an elite bias, which uh, you know, people like us, um, we know people whose jobs have been displaced by technology. Uh, but there have been previous technological revolutions. Um, freight containerization. Uh, we used to have hundreds of thousands of, of people unloading ships in all the major ports of millions around the world, Absolutely. all of those jobs are gone, replaced by giant cranes. But you and I didn't know any of those people. You know, none, of, none of my friends were longshoremen. And so it was invisible, but it was in, in way, many ways far more disruptive to people's lives than anything coming out of Silicon Valley now. Um, coal mining, uh, you know, Trump talks about it. it, it we used to have in, uh, um, in, in the 1940s, there were, uh, um, several hundred thousand coal miners. Uh, there's now about 40,000. Uh, where did those jobs go? It, it, wasn't, um, it wasn't environmental policies. That's only in the last few years. Uh, it wasn't, what happened was technology. We, re, we used to send men to the underground to dig coal. Now we just use high explosives to blow the tops off mountains. Uh, and um, again, uh, uh, I don't know any coal miners. But the point is that, that there's, no, there's nothing going on now that is more revolutionary in its impact on, on workers than what has happened in the past. It's just more visible to those of us who, who push words around for a living. Um, and uh, uh, you know, if we ever, if there really comes a time when robots are taking all the jobs, which is something people have been predicting for, for, uh, for 70, 80 years, but, and, uh, but OK, maybe someday it happens. Uh, then we need to talk about something like universal basic income. But the problem right now is that either your basic income, the, ga the income guarantee, is too small to live on, or it's enormously expensive. Uh, and I don't think we're ready to, to have the kind of, of taxation that would be required to have an adequate universal basic income, and an inadequate is just... Uh, not helpful. So what, what, what we want instead, for now at least, is programs that are more targeted, that are based upon need, so that you can actually supply people with enough to live on without it being a, a gigantic amount of money. Uh, again, it, come back to me in, in, you know, when the robots actually arrive, uh, <laughs> assuming that it's not Arnold Schwarzenegger come to wipe us out, and, uh, the, um, and, and then we, can, it, we might have to reconsider. But right now, it's kind of a, it's an, it's an unrealistic solution to an imaginary problem. So my, you might tell that I, I don't actually think it's a very good idea. I see. 
But universal basic income, would you agree that if we were to introduce it, it would actually increase inequality because people who need to spend the money would spend it, but people who don't need it would save it? No, it's, it's you don't a, believe in that idea. argument. Oh no, the people uh, look. The people who 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 don't need it have incomes uh, so much higher that it would they'd hardly notice it. Okay. I mean, uh, uh, me, uh, even me. I mean, I'm not. I I routinely. Um, uh, you know, meet with people who are worth a, who, a thousand times what I'm worth. But, the, uh, the, but, uh, but even a highly paid professional uh, is, uh, the kind, we're talking about universal basic income of $1,000 a, a month. month. Yeah. I would really, that would, would make no difference at all to the way I live, but it would be, so it, it's not, no, it, I, I don't, th that's, there are, the, the problem with UBI is simply that, that the, the sums that are being proposed are too small and the sums that would be required to make it workable are too large. Well, we all appreciate that. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Krugman.